Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, please. Passing in review briefly of last week. Started a new series, and we're passing in review briefly. We're talking about kingdom principles, and this is something that's on my heart, and I believe that's going to be a little different than, I don't know, I think maybe differently than most pastors. I'm kind of strange and weird and crazy and, and um, I'm obnoxious to be around sometimes, but I'm not a quitter. And I believe that we're building something here that will last a thousand years. I believe that we're building generations here, not just um, something that's going to, when I stop pastoring, it's going to be just taken out of the way. But I think, I I believe that the next generation will take this thing 10, 15 times better than we did. And that the greatest churches and the greatest, um, I believe the greatest times for America, the greatest churches, everything else are yet to come. And I believe it's because of the people sitting in this room today and the young people sitting in this room today. Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, Jesus answered said to him, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is in heaven. And I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God gave us the keys of the kingdom of of heaven, and we have to be sensitive to our kids. We're, if your kids are a little fussy, please, we're, we're recording and things, so please just make sure you're, there's a place over here to take them out. Um, Jesus talked about kingdom principles. He didn't talk about he talked about being born again once, but he talked about kingdom principles a bunch of times. He said things like this: Matthew thirteen eleven says he said to them, "Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given." Matthew four seventeen. From this time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 24. Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness. And he went on and on and on. Many times he talked about, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Last week we talked about, What do I get? What do I get if I plant myself in a church and work in the nursery? And and what do I get if I'm you know on the paint crew and the and the you know, the pull the weeds crew, and what if I get if I'm running a camera? You know, there's people back in that wall, behind that wall back there that you never see because they're back there behind directing traffic of the videos and different things. And what do I get? Well, we talked about how David wanted to build God a house, a little house, and God said, because you want to build me a house, I'm going to build you a house. And then in 1 Kings chapter 11, and don't have to turn over there, but 53 years after David's death, God was still honoring David's commitment to the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 15, 1 through 5, 86 years after David's death, God was still honoring David's commitment to the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 16 through 19, 156 years after David's death, God was still honoring David's commitment to the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 34 and 35, 313 years after David's death, God was still honoring David and his commitment to the Lord. I believe that when we sell out to a vision, when we sell out to the things of God, God builds you a house in the spiritual realm that you don't think what you're doing right now affects generations, but I believe it does. I believe what you do right now affects generations. I believe the way that you live the life, your, your life, the way you act. I'm cognizant, Therese and I are cognizant of that all the time, that the future generations are going to be affected by what we do as people right now. Americans think right now, we always think about, I've got to get mine, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, I'm going to live my life how I want to live it, and all those kind of things. And I'm thinking about, I believe God has a, a, a thousand-year plan for families to think about generational, and you might be the one that interrupts that, generational thing. I, I, I have no doubt in my mind that somewhere down the road, you know, a hundred years ago that I had relatives there, I had some spiritual relatives that were in, that were in Finland and then in, in Minnesota, Minnesota. They were in Minnesota. Is that how we say it, Lise? A? Is that how we say it, A? Yeah, whatever. But we, in, in Minnesota, and they were, they were staunch apostolic Lutheran people, and they were, they were, uh, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't agree with them doctrinally, but the reality is I believe that probably why I'm standing here today is probably something my great-great-grandfather did, who I never met. Probably some of the generational stuff is happening because of that. You know, we don't do this thing alone. Turn your Bibles over to Hebrews chapter 7. This is a body we have, and a believers come together, and we work together, and we're different things. And, and let me show you something, that, a little key principle here about 
about I uh, believe business practices and and family practices and church practices and all these kind of things and in Hebrews chapter seven verse one says then Melchizedek king of Salem priest of the Most High God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him now here's Melchizedek blessing him there's something about blessing there's something about generational blessings here that a- uh, Melchizedek blessed him and it says blessed him to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all. It's the first part we ever received the tithe. First being translated king of righteousness, then all calls for king of Salem, king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from the brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. Now watch this now. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. What he's saying there is basically this. And you're going to find this in, in body of Christ, the way we work together, the way things work generational, hus- husband, wife, father, mother, um, son, you know, uh, dad, um, son, daughter, you know, da- you know, the whole family spiritual thing works on this principle. What is the principle? Abram was promised by God in, in, his name was Abram and then became Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He said, get out from your countrymen and from your family and from all those things. He says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, it took, this promise was, uh, had to be patient because it, we figure it took 25 years for him to have Isaac, about 25 years. But nothing, listen to me now, nothing happened. Here this man sat on the promise. He had a vision from God and nothing happened to him until Melchizedek comes in and blesses him. He said he, it says right here, he said he had the promise but needed the blessing. And sometimes we just don't, we overlook scriptures like that. It says he had a promise but needed a blessing. I believe that I stand in this pulpit today because a man by the name of Earl Matson, who on his best day was not a very good preacher. He was my pastor and, and I can honestly say that I don't remember I can never remember him preaching a message where I went out of there and went. That was life changing. I don't. I can't remember him even teaching anything that was even that I. I don't even remember his messages, because he wasn't a good teacher. But he was a, a father figure to me, and I'll never forget us sitting in a car one day, and this is just after I got out of Bible school, and, and some people had kind of you know split his church and different things. And I don't know how I understood this, but I was 20, 21, 22 years old. And I looked at him and I said, Pastor, just let everybody get out of the car here. You go into the house. I want to talk to my pastor for a little bit. And I talked to my pastor. And I said, Pastor, I want you to know. I said, I will never leave you. I will never, ever betray you. And I'll never leave you. And he said, I know that about you. And I believe that my pastor blessed me. And the reason why I have what I have today the reason why I am where I am today, I'd like to tell you it's because of my talents. And of course, I'd like to tell you because it's my good looks. Them things left a long time ago. But I think it's because I was blessed by somebody. I think I was blessed. See, a lot of times we carry a promise, covenant relationship, you carry a promise but need a blessing. And I encourage you, whether it's in a family structure, or business structure, or you generally are just short of a relationship in your life from going to the next level. You're generally just short of a relationship coming into your life to take you to the next level. Now, I wasn't going to share all that this morning, but I just thought I'd share that with you. So we have all this stuff happening to us, and then we have this covenant relationship stuff covenant relationship is not understood by most people most people don't get covenant they they say i'm covenant i'm covenant i'm covenant with you i'm covenant with you until the first sign of trouble and then they're out of there with you or they get mad at you or something like that and they and and they don't understand covenant relation covenant relationship is deep and it's it's through the struggles and the trials and the tribulations and different things covenant relationship is deep it's 
it's kind of like I hope that we're portraying that in our fight club, that these guys are, these guys, i tell you what, these guys, some of these guys, I would go to war with these guys. Because there's just something about, and I don't mean just to sound weird, but there's something about a brotherhood of guys that just said, look, let's do something together. Let's pull together. Let's work together for a cause. And there's something about covenant that's deep. I know that this may be hard to believe, but there's people that have been with us for many years. Uh, Mitch and Helen have been with us for many years. You know, from the day we opened the door. Wave your hand, Mitch and Helen, over there. From the day we opened the door. They, and, and I'm sure that they've never been mad at me ever. And I'm sure that they probably thought that the glory of God was upon this place and just loved to be a part of this place. But there's something deep between us. We don't need, you know, it's a, there's just something deep there that just somebody like that comes and they drive from Amboy. Can anything good come out of Amboy? I don't know. <laughs> drive from Amboy for years and years and years of their life, for 30-some years of their life, and they lay down their lives for this place, and we wouldn't be where we're at without those two people coming alongside of Theresa and I and, and helping us in that place. There's something deep about that. There's something deep. I, 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 I don't know why I'm sharing this this morning, but there's just something deep about that. There's something God wants deep. He wants relationships deep and covenant, not weird and, you know, and, you know, well, we need to, we need to hang out together. Oh, please, you don't even want to hang out with me. Most people, I will, I will, you don't, I'm not even that nice. Just, just be covenant with me. You don't even want to hang out with me. I'll probably get in your business and you'll get offended if you hang out with me. You just don't want to hang out with me, man. You gotta, but there's something deep about covenant relationship. I think about Jay here, you know, Jay's been with us. How long have you guys been with us for 29 years? 29 years? Jay came in, man, and he's got his hair down to here, you know. I mean, he's got, you know, it's about touching the ground, you know. It was like Rapunzel or something, you know. <laughs> and then and, and Lisa and Jay were living together and pregnant with Greg, who's, you know, and they come in, they get saved. The first Sunday they, they come in, they turn their lives over to the Lord. They've been with us ever since. And there's just something about covenant, deep relationship that I can speak anything to this guy, and he can speak anything to me. He can say anything he wants to me, and I can say anything I want to them because it's just deep. It's, it's way beyond, it's way beyond just average stuff. We're building something here at Faith Center that's just way beyond something that's just shallow and get by stuff. It's, it's deep. Now, if we ever get religious and, you know, well, that, there's families just control the territory. Oh, please, you've got to get over that. We'll cast devils out of those families. But, because we're never going to get religious around here. Just Listen to my message last night if you don't want to just hear. Just, it was not religious last night, let me tell you. But there's something about deep stuff. There's something about God wants covenant. He wants deep. The Lord, the Lord did this to bring us covenant relationship. Remember these scriptures in Galatians chapter 3? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it was written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So he talks about the, he, he said, I'm going to cut covenant. I'm going to, the word covenant means cut where blood flows. I'm going to go to the cross so that this thing can be deep. We're going to about ready to start a series called I See a Church. A couple more weeks, and then we're going to start a series about what I see as a pastor, where we're going for the future generations of this church to set us up for a thousand years. And we're going to talk about two or three weeks of I see a church and what we see, what I see inside of me, and we're going to post it on the walls and you're going to have things where we can see where we're going as a church. But here, man, the Lord sent his only begotten son so that we could have deep covenant relationships that would just last for, for an eternity and a lifetime. And, and I, I don't know, you know, I'm not the s sharpest knife in the drawer. I graduated from Battleground High School, and uh, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but th th let's see if this makes sense to you. If, if one of the major scriptures of the New Testament is, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, be made a curse for us, for his written curses, everyone hanging on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, wouldn't it make sense to go find out what the blessings that he wants to come on you? Yeah. Well, let's go find out. The only time we can find out where he was blessed was when Melchizedek blessed Abraham. 
It's the only time we ever see the, the blessing that was poured out upon Abraham. We don't see it used anywhere else. So we have to find out what is the covenant blessing that God wants all of us to have. Well, in Genesis chapter 14, we just read a little bit of that. But um, um, he says, you know, he talks about now in ver- chapter 14, verse 14. Now Abram um, heard, well, actually, we, we heard the story of it. We read the story of it in, uh, in, in Hebrews. But here in Genesis 14, 14, it says, Now Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, and he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan, and he divided the forces against them by night. And his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hoba, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and brought back his brother and lots and goods and women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the king of the Shava, that is the king's valley, and returned from the defeat of Shandalorim and the kings who were with him. Melchizedek, brought, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, that's covenant meal, and the priests of the Most High God, and blessed him. And he said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands and gave him a tithe of all. So we see a threefold blessing in here that Abraham, that Melchizedek blessed him with the specific words. And then the chapters later, God changes his name from Abram to Abraham and things start rolling for him. Nothing rolled for him until this time, but things start rolling for him. And we have the Jewish nation that we have today because Melchizedek came out and blessed him with these three blessings. And over the next couple of weeks, we want to talk to you about these three blessings. We won't necessarily use them in the order of their importance. But he says, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies in your hand. The first one I want to talk about isn't necessarily the, the first on here, but he said, Of Abram of God most high. The word most high here is... It says literally in the, in the Hebrew, it says the elevated one, or you're of Abram, most high, of most of the most high. Now, it's the same verbiage that we have throughout the Bible when he wants to describe a family name. Remember over in Matthew chapter 16 where he says, Simon bar Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father was in heaven. He, he mentions that. We just read that a little while ago. He said, Simon bar Jonah. Or you would say, like Joel's here, you would say, Joel of Glenn Johnson. That would be the biblical term. You'd say, Joel of Glenn Johnson. Here he says, Abram of the Elevated One. Now remember again, in in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 6, he says, Abram, get out from your countrymen. We understand that, that tradition tells us and some of the history tells us that Abraham's relatives and things were moon worshipers and crazy people. So he pulls Abraham out of there and says, I'm going to make you a, a great nation. And he pulls him out of there. And he basically says, now I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do something different with you. I'm going to make you a whole generation different. You're going to see. And so the blessing part of this thing that comes upon the Gentiles is... Whatever your DNA is now, when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you are no longer spiritually DNA connected to this world system anymore, but now you're of the elevated one. Now, for me, I've told this story before, but that's a big deal to me. And I didn't get this when I first started this. I I, I come to know this revelation and knowledge later. But if you follow my family history and tree, somewhere down the road, uh, my great-grandfather, who I never met, was an apostolic Lutheran minister and lived in Minnesota. And then my grandfather moved out here from Minnesota, and I think he was getting away from his grandfather, from, from his dad, and he was back, he was a, my grandfather backslid and was, I remember him, I mean, he died when I was in uh, second grade. But I remember he was, a, he was about this big around, and, and he loved his beer. Man, he loved his beer. And he was sitting in a, we had a finished sauna right out here in downtown uh, Battleground. And they had the, uh, the, he built this big shop, and the shop was bigger than the house. The house was about probably 700 square feet. And I remember being in this house when I was a kid, and all of our cousins would be in the house, and there would be 40 or 50 people in this house because 
all the men would go out and take a sauna, and all the women would later take a sauna, or vice versa. And then everybody would come into the house, and they would stand up because there was no chairs. And there'd be 40 people in this house that was no bigger than just a little spot about like this, the kitchen and the living room. And then there was just a little tiny, like a little closet thing where there was the bed and then the main bedroom. And everybody smoked. And uh, so w the kids, all those kids, we didn't think it was abnormal, but we would um, get in the farthest corner of the room of the living room and we would lay on the floor as close as we could get to the, to the carpet so we could suck some kind of fresh air out of out of the thing and this didn't happen three times this was every Friday night I mean every Friday night I remember one time we were we were we were the uh, we were that family in the neighborhood and the neighbors called the cops on us and I remember getting so, I thought, who do these neighbors think they are calling the cops on, on us, my wonderful family? And I realized later, they're like, hey, we were that family that everybody called the cops on. <laughs> Can anybody relate to this besides me, you know? Was your family that way too? I mean, they were good people, don't get me wrong, they're good people. But I grew up in my, my I remember my, my grandmother, she, she loved Portland wrestling. And she would sit in this blue velour chair with wood, wood handles. And she'd have a parliament cigarette. And my, grand, my aunt and my, my grandmother lived together at the end of their lives because both their husbands died. And she always drank her beer out of a glass. And she would shake. Terrible. She just had the, the shakes. And in watching Portland wrestling, Get him, Lonnie! Lonnie! Oh, my God! Tony! Tony Bourne! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! My God! My. And she hardly spoke English, so it was kind of like, and she'd say, Satana Pelageli, which means smell my belly button. And, uh, <laughs> and she would just, she was just drunk. You guys knew that, didn't you? That's, that's tongues and interpretation. <laughs> but, and then, I, and then, you know, I'd say, Grandma, can I have a sip of beer? She'd say, sure. And she'd give me a drink of a beer. And I was four years old and I started drinking That was a loving grandma. It's child abuse today. <laughs> my grandfather was a great... I mean, I loved my grandfather. He always had... I mean, he went out and bought bikes for me. And, and I mean, like, you know, $2 bikes. And he'd always have them fixed up and always have a bike for me when I came over there. And my, I love my grandparents. I just... I read, that's the fondest memories of my life are with my grandparents. But they were drunks. My aunts were drunks, and my uncles were drunks, and my dad was a drunk, and, and everybody was a drunk. I remember many times driving home, sitting on, my dad's lap, steer, I was sitting on my dad's lap, steering to get us home. He pushed the gas, and I steered to get us home. That's child abuse today. That was fun when I was a kid. We, we, had, cars that, we had cars that you would... Those kids would get on the back seat of the car and we you know and you and and we drop marbles down the holes that were in the rusted out things of the cars as we we're driving down the road and so when I got saved and I found myself steeped in alcoholism at 16 17 18 years old and even even part of my 19th year, I was looking for something different. I wanted something different than that. I, I didn't like where I was going. I, didn't li I, wanted to build, I wanted to build a family. I just wanted to build something that was, you know, I saw the consequences of, uh, I, I, all I knew is all these people that were loving, wonderful people, but I saw the consequences of the actions that all my relatives had. A lot of you young people, you, you, don't, you don't see the consequences because you you've never grown up in it, so you don't see the consequences of your actions that will, that will eventually catch up to you. You don't see them. But I wanted out of that thing. I said, my God, I've got to get out of this thing. I've got to get out. So not knowing these scriptures the way they are, not knowing how it was, but the reality is now I see and I live by faith on these principles. 
that my pedigree, my actual DNA, spiritually speaking, which affects the natural realm, is no longer connected to the Johnson family. It's now part of the elevated one, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the generation that I will build because of this kind of stuff, the DNA that I'm producing is not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. And I'm going to build a generation of, we're speaking generational down the road, hundreds, I believe, of years down the road, of generational thinkers that think and possess the earth. And, you know, there are many scriptures that I, that I speak on, on um, Thursday mornings have to do with my, rel- my, my uh, seed will inherit the earth. And wealth and riches will be in their house. The generation of the upright will be blessed. And my seed will inherit the earth. And I see my seed growing up and literally taking taking control of destinies and stuff in a spiritual sense and in a financial sense and in a, in a, a authority over the devil sense of just walking in this thing deep. You say, well, I don't necessarily agree with you. Fine, I don't care, but I believe this stuff and it's going to happen in the Johnson family. I believe that we're, I believe we're doing something different here at Faith Center. I, I, I don't know why I say this this morning, but I, I believe this isn't, a, this isn't just normal church here. Now, there's a lot of good churches. Don't get me wrong. There's great churches, and you come, go, whatever. That's not, I'm not trying to condemn anybody because people just, some people fit, some people don't. I understand all that. That's not a big deal to me. But when you have that, and it's deep, and you plant somewhere, and, you, and it's not just here. You could plant somewhere else, whatever. My encouragement is just to get planted somewhere. Get under that blessing somewhere. The pastor blessed me. And I don't think it's any accident. I think it's just a, I think it's just a, a, a snub at the devil that we rented the little square dance center as a church 35 years ago right over here, and now we own 14 acres across the street from it. That's my, that's my pastor over there preaching and now he owns 14 acres across the street. He'd been long dead, but he owns 14 acres across the street because this is generational and thought process and deep and, and covenant, and I love it. I love it. Nothing, I told my wife and I were driving home from church last night and said, you know, we're in, a, we're in such a great season in our lives. It's just such a great season. And I just love where we're at. I love, but, I, but, but if you think building this thing, and I'm talking about building the church and building the life and building family, and if you think it's been easy, you crazy. If you think building a business is easy, go talk to some of these business owners and tell them, you think it's easy. You think we just walk down the street and this thing grows. It doesn't, man. You've got to babysit this all the time. You've got to babysit your life. You've got to babysit. You've got to... You gotta watch your life. You gotta watch it like a hawk because the enemy will come in and say, you know what? That generational thing will work for the good, but I'm gonna turn around and try to use it for the bad. And I'm gonna try to develop generations of of crazy, stupid people. So us righteous people, not righteous because of what we done, but righteous because of what he did, we gotta stand up, we gotta rise up, and we gotta say, That's our this is our place now, man. Come on, let's 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 possess the earth. You say, do you think we can do that, Pastor? I don't know, but let's give it a shot. Why, do I, why does everybody say, well, I don't think we can do that? Well, I just figure out, you know, let's just try to eliminate drug addiction from Clark County. I mean, maybe we can't, but well, at least we could try. You know, I don't, have you ever heard anybody ever say that before, before we hooked up and built a vacation? I just said, let's just eliminate drug addiction from Clark County. Well, I just think that's ridiculous. I don't think we can. I don't know if we can either, but at least we're going to give it a shot. Let's build a generation of a thousand years. I don't know if we can't. Well, let's just give it a shot. I don't know. Let's, let's just build something that the next generation can, can take and just go for and grab a hold of and say, I'll take my place. I'll put my selfishness down and I'll take my place in the kingdom of God and do what's right in the things of God. I don't know if you got anything on this, but I preach myself happy. You could ask, you could go look at my notes. That is not. This is like, that's like one scripture on my notes today. That's all it is. One or two scriptures on my notes. That's all it is.
Let's talk about you this morning. Let's talk about your life. Where are you at with the Lord? What, what do you need from the Lord this morning? I got my elders and leaders and pastors that are going to stand up here real quick and they're going to be up here. Come on, let's just, elders and leaders and pastors and everybody on duty this morning, just stand up here if you would. And small group leaders and different people. Where are you at with the Lord? These people are, are here. They want to pray for you. They want to pray for you if you're, if you have problems in whatever area of your life, you need healing, you need, uh, you need, you've never been born again. You say, well, I don't understand. I, I don't get what he's talking about there. I don't understand this whole covenant. I, just come up and talk to one of these people and they'll, they'll pray you right through that thing. You need to be filled with the spirit and pray with the spirit. These people will help you. If you need to be, you get right with God, these people will help you. No matter what the situation is, these people are trained to help you and pray for you. We're going to close the service by praying over these prayer requests. Do we have those real quick? So stand up with me if you would, and then we're going to close the service. And, and in just a few minutes, it'll take a little bit. I know Seth's going to make his way down from Longview to do this graduation and a couple of the guys and different things. And Kelso this morning. And so it'll be a few minutes before the food's ready, I think, in there. But feel free, all the families and Fight Club people, just to go in there and start picking out. But here's some prayer requests that came in on these prayer requests. Healthy pregnancy. Uh, good luck fishing today. I won't pray for luck, but you have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and all the elk in the woods. Healing from bronchitis. A friend who's feeling suicidal. Do you know that almost every single week we get something about suicide on these almost every week? Let me tell you, man, suicide is the devil just talking to you because he's... Most of the time when people are suicidal, it's because the enemy, the, the, God has an amazing plan for you and the enemy is trying to take you out. Father, I just pray for these requests right now in the name of Jesus. Every request met in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for that person that's feeling suicidal. I thank you that they'll come up here and talk to one of these people. And realize that God has an amazing plan and a destiny and a purpose for them. Father, I thank you, Father God, for a healthy pregnancy. I thank you for healing of bronchitis. And I thank you for a boatload sinking fish story today. And Father, we just help the Seahawks as best you can today. In Jesus' name we pray. And if you agree with that, say amen. amen. Love you guys.